A lot of people really like the Galactic Empire because of all of that military hardware, and who can blame them? The Imperial military is every 12-year-old boy's dream. The Empire had unrestricted access to the galaxy's resources and unlimited political support for the development of all sorts of amazing super weapons and high-tech killing machines. I mean, have you guys ever seen an Imperial-class Star Destroyer hovering just a few hundred feet above a city? There's such a cognitive disconnect when you look at it, one can't help but think, how can something so freaking big just be gently floating in the air like it's attached to some invisible strings? And it creates a sense of wonder and fear all at the same time, and that is exactly what Emperor Palpatine and his closest advisors want. You see, Imperial military doctrine, it was not created in the halls of some military academy. It wasn't tried and tested on the battlefields of the Outer Rim. No, the Imperial military's doctrine was actually created by a severely paranoid man with a terribly traumatic upbringing which involved fighting space tigers with wooden spears. We of course are talking about Wilhelm Tarkin and his extremely destructive doctrine, which like its creator was deeply rooted in fear of the very people it was supposed to be governing and taking care of. There's something really appealing to the simplicity of the Tarkin doctrine. It was very black and white, and uh, for someone like Emperor Palpatine, it meant that he no longer had to focus on the various problems that plagued the Empire. Instead, this was about taking all of those problems and sweeping them beneath the rug, and then basically oppressing anyone who dare spoke out. And the idea here is to create or instill a sense of fear that is so great that no one dares to speak out. The reality is Emperor Palpatine didn't have the time or energy to focus on actually improving the lives of the average Imperial citizen, and that is because governance is extremely difficult, and ultimately power sharing is not only necessary, but the only way you can get specialists to focus on specific fields of governance. Forget about good or evil intentions, this is merely about competence. And uh, when you're able to power share, you can delegate individuals who are specifically trained to tackle very specific issues, allowing the head of state to focus on the larger picture. And so, ideally, Palpatine had individuals focusing on issues like economic stagnation in the Outer Rim, or inflation issues caused by the excessive printing of galactic credits and the ballooning of the Imperial military budgets. Or the growing threat of unidentified alien species in the unknown region of the Empire. Uh, how can one individual, one autocrat, have the wisdom and energy to deal with all of these problems by themselves? The simple answer is he cannot. Well, at least he can't without power sharing. The issue here is that Emperor Palpatine has left a path of destruction, skeletons, and dead Jedi babies in his wake. And this really comes with his lack of trust for other people. He has a very Sith view of the world. You know, Palpatine is a very cynical individual. He doesn't believe that others have good intentions, that there are good intentioned servants of the state. He believes that everyone is like him, fighting and scrounging for power. And if they aren't fighting and scrounging for power, well, they're just weak and stupid. And he really wants the empire, the entire empire, to think the same way. Don't trust your neighbor, don't trust your colleagues, don't trust anyone except good old Uncle Palpatine. And to make matters even crazier, this is the culture that Palpatine creates and enforces within his own military and government. By pitting everyone in the Empire against each other and by limiting the power of individual Imperial officials, Palpatine basically guarantees that his underlings will never be able to cooperate with each other and overthrow him in a coup because they'll be too busy fighting against each other for whatever scraps he tossed them. And while this might keep Emperor Palpatine in power, what it does is it destroys a lot of talented people who otherwise could bring a lot of benefits to his empire. I mean, guys like director Orson Krennic might be a little bloodthirsty, but he successfully managed the construction of a moon-sized battle station in complete secrecy somehow. He's a skilled individual and a great asset for the empire, but what ultimately does him in is a rivalry with the much more powerful Moff Wilhelm Tarkin, whose sole strength is that he is ruthless and great at undermining his colleagues, stealing their ideas, and getting rid of them. This is not a system based on merit or fairness. This is a system where the majority of people are oppressed and the leaders, the elite, are mostly criminals and psychopaths fighting against each other for more power. In this kind of system, it's oftentimes easier for the head of state to focus on solely maintaining power rather than taking a legitimate shot at governance. And we take a closer look at the Empire, almost every institution created by Palpatine is designed for form over function. The idea is to 
get this message out that the Empire are strong and it will improve everyone's lives as long as you are loyal to it. And that problem is especially prevalent in the Imperial military. You guys might have heard that the Imperial military is the strongest the galaxy has ever seen, but in my opinion, it's actually one gigantic, costly paper tiger. It's a term that actually comes from Chinese, zi lao hu. And what it basically means is some things upon first inspection might look very terrifying, but if you view it from a certain angle, you might discover that that terrifying tiger is actually a 2D cutout and not that scary at all. But before we continue talking about how the Imperial military is a paper tiger, a quick word from today's sponsor, Ownersaber.com. They are the premier lightsaber manufacturer for people looking for unique or replica lightsabers, like this Lego saber called The Last Brick, which is both fun and immediately recognizable. Or perhaps something a bit more familiar, but also different at the same time, like this. It's called the Black Moon Saber, and it is a replica of the Darksaber, and it features that very distinct looking hilt and edged blade, which reminds us of its Mandalorian creator. Most of the blades from Ownersaber.com comes with either a simple RGB blade, which is good for sparring and smacking around. Then you have these pixel blades, which have a LED strip running alongside the entire length of the blade, which gives you all sorts of really cool looking effects, like this. Right now, all blades from Ownersaber.com are 30% off plus free shipping. We'll link them down in the comment section below. Also, you guys can use our promo code that's EWOK, all caps, for an additional $15 off. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. At the end of the Clone Wars, the Empire had access to thousands of fully functional Venator-class Star Destroyers. Most of these ships were less than two or three years old. Better yet, these weren't your typical battleships, like the ones used during the Old Republic period. These were state-of-the-art vessels. The Vendor class Star Destroyer was actually an assault carrier, and it could carry a complement of a few hundred hyperdrive-equipped starfighters, giving the Vendor class Star Destroyer a massive amount of range. You could essentially deploy this ship in the middle of an entire sector, and then send out sorties to patrol the various edges of that sector, and keep a pretty visible presence almost everywhere. This is a very modern design for a Star Destroyer and it perfectly fit the Empire's need at the time, which was peacekeeping. But this Republic ship alongside a huge amount of Republic starfighters were all dismantled and sold for scrap at the end of the Clone Wars. And in its place came the Imperial class Star Destroyer and the TIE Fighter. These were ships that were not only a leap backwards in capability, but also a leap backwards when it came to naval doctrine. The ISD was a massive battleship that featured only line of sight turbo lasers, which guaranteed that if the destroyer engages another capital ship in battle, it will most definitely receive devastating return fire. This is a mentality that existed on Earth during the age of sail, when ships would line up next to each other at pretty close ranges and then just exchange broadsides and accept huge casualties. It's an utterly stupid move from a military standpoint. It puts Imperial sailors in unnecessary danger. But Palpatine doesn't really care because this ship, with its massive wedge shape, is designed to either inspire loyalty through fear or through awe. And all those turbo lasers, while not effective at really long distances, do a lot of damage to ground targets from orbits. Plus, resupplying a turbo laser battery is extremely cheap compared to, I don't know, using smart munitions like missiles. The idea here is to drown out your enemy with a saturation of firepower. It's definitely not about precision. And this is exactly what happens when your emperor and his closest advisors design a Star Destroyer based on ancient Sith drawings and childhood trauma. This is what happens when civilians without the appropriate experience and knowledge try to design a multi-billion credit mile-long starship. This is something that would never happen in a state where the people have a voice and are allowed to take part in governance. They would see this as absurd. The idea of the head of state even having input at any design level of a military vehicle is really only something that would be highlighted in a dictatorship with a cult of personality as something positive and not alarmingly incompetent and potentially corrupt. But this is the truth about the Empire. The, the propaganda, the speeches by the Empire made you think that the Empire is the best thing ever made. It was efficient, it was a meritocracy. But the reality is a lot simpler. This was all just lies. I mean, take a closer look at the Imperial class Star Destroyer. It rarely had the opportunity to utilize its one strength and that was its overwhelming firepower. Instead, the Rebel Alliance focused on the ISD's lack of long range weapons, point defense systems, and woefully inadequate fighter complement, and used a wide variety of small hyperdrive equipped snub fighters that were able to quickly enter a system, launch their munitions at a target, and then simply disappear. We did an entire video recently talking about how more rational and competent individuals like Thrawn used interdiction ships to trap rebels and destroy them in real space. 
But Thrawn experienced discrimination, most likely because he was a successful blue alien within the Imperial Navy, and so a lot of his ideas were rejected. And so the interdictor uh, type ship was never widely adopted by the Empire, despite it being the proper reaction to the rebel tactics. And so instead of stopping the rebellion in its earlier days, the rebels would often be successful in their daring slash and run attacks. A Star Destroyer is always going to be vulnerable to a proton torpedo, and the loss of a few rebel starfighters will hardly dent the Rebel Alliance's military capabilities. The Empire's incompetence, its reliance on form over function, allowed the Rebel Alliance to hang around for much longer than they deserve to. And then finally, when you had conventional battles, the Rebels came up with another ingenious solution to the ISD, and that was the Mon Calamari Cruiser, which had, which had redundant shield generators and could basically take all the punishment an ISD could dish out. But the biggest problem with the Imperial Clan Star Destroyer was its logistical tail. And it was a really long tail. Apparently, it was the most resource-intensive vessel in the entire Imperial military, and the second Imperial supply lines were affected by the growing success of the New Republic war effort. Imperial Clan Star Destroyers started having problems resupplying, and oftentimes their defenses and their weapons would be only uh, half operational because of that. Soon after the Battle of Endor, the ISD became hunted instead of the hunter because of these shortages. The massive and overindulgent design of the ISD at the peak of the Empire's power was seen as wasteful, but post-Endor, it was a huge liability and threat now. The ship was too large, too slow in subspace, and now it presented a huge target for enemy forces to focus on. To make matters even worse, only a handful of shipyards like Quat and Fondor had docks large enough to accommodate the Star Destroyer for a quick resupply. Now, the Imperial Clan Star Destroyer had to rely on smaller shuttles Bearing supplies ship by ship up into its hull, which of course makes the entire process of resupplying a huge headache, especially if you're running away from rebel hunter and killer squads. The Empire instead could have brought dozens of Arcadian class light cruisers instead of just one Star Destroyer. These smaller ships would have been much easier to keep running and could have been resupplied in small systems with very little infrastructure. The Empire could have also upgraded the Venator class Star Destroyer to keep up with the uh, modern military technology, but of course, no. That's not what Palpatine wanted. He wanted everything new, and he wanted everything to look terrifying. And perhaps equally as important was Palpatine's promise at the end of the Clone Wars to get people jobs. You know, the galaxy lay in ruins. Most citizens of the Republic tolerated the transition from Republic to Empire solely based on that promise. Palpatine sought to fulfill his promise by creating billions of jobs in the defense industry, building the future Imperial fleet. The idea was the shift a large percentage of the people who worked in the private sector into the military industrial complex. The more ships you build, the more people you take off the streets and put into factories. And these people actually become a part of the system. They become dependent on your government for a paycheck, which makes you know rebelling against the empire a lot more difficult. Now, most people are willing to trade a little freedom for a good paycheck that will provide them with everything else they think they need. And so we have a military that is designed to create fear in its people. We have a military designed to create jobs. And we also have a military that is not elite at all. I mean, yes, the Death Star is a super weapon and it's impressive, but Palpatine's goal at the end of the day was not just to rule the core region of the galaxy, but the entire galaxy. And so at the end of the day, no matter what Imperial super fans are gonna say, the Imperial military was all about quantity and not actually quality. I mean, look at what the rank and file Imperial pilots had to deal with. Look at the standard TIE fighter from the Imperial Navy. This ship was roughly a third of the cost of a T-65B X-Wing or a RZ-1A wing. And anyone immediately understands why this TIE fighter lacks a hyperdrive, sealed cockpit, heavy weapons, a shield, and many other things. What it did have, however, was probably one of the most superbly designed ion engines from a manufacturing standpoint. Not only was this engine extremely cheap to mass manufacture, it had zero moving parts, which meant maintenance was a breeze. The ship was also manufactured in massive contracts, further cutting down the price for the individual ship. Now, Imperial pilots were exceptionally well-trained, and they definitely were better than their Rebel counterparts. But the TIE Fighter's vulnerabilities, especially its lack of shields, led to much higher casualties as a result. Now, military dictatorships generally stay in power and enjoy a mandate to rule based on their ability to protect the people from whatever threat there is. In some cases, the threat is real. In some cases, they're, you know, artificially inflated threats that are created by the people in power. But it's no secret, the most efficient societies in the world almost exclusively have high amounts of individual freedom and are not military first dictatorships. The best nations, the best states, the best governments strive to maximize the potential of the individual so that they can, in turn, provide a lot of value and worth 
for that government or society. Autocrats like Palpatine simply spend way too much energy focused on oppressing the people when he should be nourishing them. The fact that no one trusts each other and they're all competing against each other at every moment means that there's no ability for collaboration or information sharing, which puts a severe limit to technological innovation. There's also the argument against maintaining a massive military force during peacetimes. As you can see, the Empire has created an Imperial Navy for a bygone era when Sith and Jedi ships would line up side by side and exchange broadsides. Most peacetime militaries are built for the last war, and when they face new war, they have to quickly reform, and the Imperial military system is just not built for flexibility. It's built for allegiance and loyalty to Palpatine. And so they were unable to properly design and manufacture a response to rebel weapons like the X-Wing and the A-Wing, which was just ripping the standard TIE fighter apart. Now, eventually, the Imperial Military Industrial Complex came up with the uh, TIE Interceptor and TIE Defender concepts. But these nodules had their own problems, and more importantly, they were deployed too little and too late. A freer society paired with a free market can be a lot more flexible in wartime. It can turn its civilian industrial capabilities into military industrial capabilities in very short order. When the Clone Wars erupted, the Grand Army of the Republic was without a capital ship. At the Battle of Geonosis, the acclimator class assault ships, which carry the Clone Army, arrived unassisted. Now, this would be a huge problem for most states, but the Republic had the benefit of you know, having a very ancient and well-developed and mature shipbuilding industry. You had outfits like Quad Drive Yards, which produced um, military ships, but also civilian ships. It didn't just have government contracts, it had contracts with uh, corporations and planetary defense forces. It had a very diverse uh, selection of clients, and it already had been tested by a very robust free market. This heavily decreases costs from the federal military for research and design, and Quad Drive Yards can basically take care of its own overhead without any government subsidies. And so within just months of the beginning of the Clone Wars, Quad Drive Yards was able to roll out the Venator-class Star Destroyer. It was a completely new platform, and despite some teething issues, it proved to be incredibly successful. It's really a testament to the Republic's very professional shipbuilding industry, something that has been nurtured by the free market over thousands and thousands of years and it's far more competitive than something like Senior Fleet Systems, which was, you know, basically uh, exclusively making fighters for the Empire. And had the Republic faced the Empire in a military conflict, the same thing that has happened to the Republic for the last thousand years would happen again. The Empire would be able to initially uh, surprise the Republic and maybe take some outer rim territories. But eventually, the Republic would retool its robust peacetime economy and use its economic might to create a military force specifically for the threat that the Empire posed in record time. And that is because the Republic has the backing of its billions, if not trillions, of citizens. These are individuals who prosper and benefit from the system that has improved their lives and given so much back to them. Whereas the Empire is just one man, a man who spends half of his time suppressing his enemies and the other half of his time finding new enemies to justify his rule. And so guys, that is why the Empire is a paper tiger. And that is why everything the Empire tries to do is going to be incompetent and hollow on the inside. And that's because they are not properly utilizing the most important asset that any nation can have, and that is its people. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. Uh, as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.